Uh, Mr. President, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to have this interview uh, at these days when we uh, remember that five years ago the Russian um, assistance came to Syria. So after five years of the Russian military operation nowadays, uh, can you say that the war in Syria now is over? No, definitely not. As long as uh, you have terrorists uh, occupying some areas of our country and uh, committing different uh, kind of uh, crimes and assassinations and uh, other crimes, uh, different kind of crimes, uh, it's not over. And I think their supervisors uh, are keen to make it still going on for a long time. That's what we believe in. And what moments of heroism of uh, the Russians uh, do you recall and keep in your heart? Uh, which of them do you consider worth of uh, telling to your grandchildren, let's say? I think so many. Uh, and I, I remember some of them, of course. But uh, after five years of this cooperation between the Syrian and the Russian army in a vicious war, uh, I think uh, heroism is becoming a collective act. It's not only individual. It's not the only few cases of heroism that you remember. Remember, for example, if you talk about the uh, military uh, aircraft pilots, uh, the air forces. Uh, the Russian pilots uh, keep uh, flying over the terrorists uh, on daily basis, mm -hmm. uh, risking their lives. And you had few aircraft that being shot by the uh, terrorists. Uh, if you talk about the other officers, uh, they are supporting the Syrian army, not in the real lines, on the front lines, and you had Martyrs. So I think what I'm going to tell my grandchildren someday, not only about, about, not only about this heroism, I'm going to talk about these common values that we have in both our armies uh, that made us brothers uh, during uh, this war, these noble uh, values, uh, faithful uh, to, to their causes, uh, 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 defending uh, the civilians, defending the innocents many things to talk about this war. And what moment uh, does symbolize for you a turning point uh, during this conflict, during this war? Yeah, uh, it's been now 10 years, nearly 10 years since uh, the war started. Uh, so you have many turning points that I can mention, not only one, uh, in different ways, let's say. The first one in 2013, uh, when we started liberating uh, many areas, especially the middle of Syria from al-Nusra. Then in 2014, it was in the other direction when ISIS appeared suddenly mm -hmm. with the American support and they occupied a very important part of Syria and Iraq at the same time. And this is where the terrorists started occupying other areas because ISIS could, uh, was able to distract the Syrian army from fulfilling its uh, mission in liberating the western part of Syria. Then the other turning point was when the Russian came to Syria in 2015 and we started together liberating many areas. In that uh, stage, let's say, after the uh, Russian uh, came to Syria to support the Syrian army, I would say uh, the turning point was to liberate the eastern part of Aleppo. This is where the liberating of other areas in Syria started from that point. It was mm -hmm. important because of the importance of Aleppo and because it was the beginning of the liberation, the large-scale liberation that continued later to, to Damascus, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the rest of Aleppo recently do, uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, the, the last battle, and other areas in, different, in the eastern part uh, of Syria and the southern part. So these are the main turning points. Uh, if you put them together, all of them are uh, strategic uh, and all of them change the course of this war. Uh, I now will turn to some uh, actual news and uh, we in Russia follow w what now is happening in uh, the region of Armenian and Azerbaijanian conflict. Yeah. And uh, definitely uh, Turkey plays a role there. Uh, is it negative or positive? Uh, that is not uh, for me to judge, but uh, I would like to ask you about uh, Turkey's and Erdogan's policies. So in recent, year, uh, in recent years, um, Turkey has been trying to maximize its international influence. We uh, all see its presence in Libya, its intervention to Syria, territorial disputes with Greece, 
and uh, now open support to Azerbaijan. Uh, what do you think about that kind of behavior of Ankara and Erdogan's personally? And should the international community pay more attention to this sort of uh, neo-Osmanism? Mm. Mm. Uh, let's be blunt uh, and uh, clear. Erdogan has supported terrorists in Syria and he's been supporting terrorists in Libya. And uh, he was the main instigator and initiator of the recent conflict that uh, happened in, uh, that's been going on in uh, uh, Nargoni-Karabakh mm -hmm. between Azerbaijan and, and Armenia. So uh, I would sum his uh, behavior as dangerous uh, for different reasons. First of all, because it reflects the Muslim Brotherhood behavior. Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist extremist group. Uh, second, because he's creating war in different areas just to distract his own public opinion in Turkey from focusing on his behavior within Turkey, inside Turkey, uh, especially after uh, the, his scandals, scandalous relation with ISIS in Syria. Uh, and everybody knows that the ISIS used to sell Syrian oil through Turkey mm -hmm. with the umbrella of the American Air Forces and of course the support of the Turks and the involvement of the Turks, not, not the support, the involvement mm -hmm. in selling this oil. So this is his goal and this is dangerous. So whether the international community should be aware or not, the word international community in reality is only a few countries, the great powers and rich countries and let's call them the influencers on the uh, political arena. Uh, the majority of this international community is complicit with Turkey in supporting the terrorists. So they know what Turkey is doing. They are happy about what Turkey is doing. And Turkey is armed for those countries in fulfilling their uh, policies and dreams in this region. So no, we cannot bet on the international community at all. You can bet on the international law, on, on the international law but it doesn't exist. There's no institution to, to, uh, to implement the international law. So we have to depend on ourselves in Syria and on the support of our friends. Uh, um, so um, about, more about this conflict, uh, so there were reports that uh, some uh, terrorists from the groups that were fighting previously in Syria are now being transferred to, uh, to this uh, conflict zone between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Yeah. Uh, can you confirm that? Do, have any information about uh, fighters yes. uh, going from Syria to... We definitely can confirm it, not because we have evidences, but sometimes if you don't have evidence, you have indications. Uh, Turkey used uh, those terrorists coming from different countries in Syria. They used the same method in Libya. They used Syrian terrorists in Libya, maybe with other nationalities. So it's self-evident and very much probable that they are using that in Nargoni Karabakh. Because, as I said earlier, they are the one who started this problem, this conflict. They encouraged this conflict. So they wanted to achieve something, and they're going to use the same method. So uh, f we can say for sure that they've been using Syrian and other nationalities of terrorists in Nargoni Karabakh. In Nargoni Karabakh. Um, uh, let's turn now to, to the uh, relations between our countries, uh, mm. Russia and Syria. Uh, are there any plans for your uh, contacts uh, or meetings with the President Putin? We had co uh, regular uh, contacts, uh, mainly on the phone. Whenever uh, something new happens, or whenever, or whenever, whenever there is a need uh, for this, uh, for, uh, for this uh, conversation, of course uh, we're going to uh, talk in the future, we're going to meet in the future, but that depends on the current, po uh, on the political situations regarding uh, Syria. And as you know now, because of the coronavirus, the whole world was uh, paralyzed. So in the near future, I think the conversation will be on the phone. And uh, will you uh, raise a question of the new credits for Syria, for new loans? Yeah, and our economic situation is very important to uh, to seek loans, but at the same time, uh, you shouldn't uh, start this 
or take this step without being able to pay back the loan. Otherwise, it's going to be a burden and it's going to be uh, a debt. So uh, it has two, two, uh, two aspects. So uh, talking about loans is in our minds and discuss it with the Russian, uh, with our Russian counterparts. But uh, we have to prepare for such a step before uh, taking it uh, seriously or practically, let's say. I see. Um, recently, the delegation from Russia came and the uh, Vice Prime Minister Barisov was here. Uh, is now uh, Syria interested in buying uh, anti-aircraft uh, systems like S-400 or uh, demanding for additional S-300? Yeah. Actually, we started a plan of up, uh, upgrading uh, our army uh, two years ago. And uh, it's self-evident that we're going to do this upgrade in cooperation with the Russian Ministry of Defense because for uh, decades now, uh, our army depends fully on the Russians' armaments. Uh, but uh, you have priorities. It's not necessarily the missiles. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have uh, other, priority, uh, other priorities now regarding the conflict on the ground. Uh, so there's a full-scale plan, mm -hmm. but uh, we have to move according to these priorities. Uh, usually we don't talk about the details mm -hmm. of our military uh, plans, but in general, as I said, it's upgrading the, uh, the army in every aspect of the military field. Uh, you definitely follow the uh, presidential campaign in the United States. Yeah. And uh, do you hope that uh, the new U.S. president, uh, regardless of the name of the winner, uh, will review sanctions policies towards Syria? Uh, we don't usually expect presidents in the American elections. We only expect CEO because you have board, this board made of the lobbies mm -hmm. and the big corporates like uh, banks and armaments and uh, oil and etc. So what you have is CEO and this is a CEO doesn't have the right or the authority to review. He has to implement. And that's what happened to Trump when he became president after the elections. Uh, he used to be CEO for many years before. Exactly, and, and he, he's CEO anyway. <laughs> but he wanted to, to follow, to pursue his own policy. And he was about to pay the price. You, know, you remember the impeachment issue. Yeah. Uh, and he had to swallow every word he said before the elections. So that's why I said we, you don't expect president, you only expect CEO. And if you want to talk about changing the policy, you have one board. The same board will not change its policy. Because the, the CEO will change, but the board is still the same. So don't expect anything. Who are this board? Sorry? Who are these people? As uh, I said, this board is made board. of uh, the lobbies. The lobbies. lobbies. So they implement whatever they want, that they control the Congress and the other, and the, the media. Uh, etc. So there's alliance between those different uh, uh, self-vested interest uh, corporates in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, so Trump uh, pledged to withdraw American troops from, from Syria, but he failed to do that. Uh, now he is being nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Do you think if he manages to bring his troops, American troops, home, uh, is he? Uh, good to, to be uh, awarded with a Nobel Peace Prize. He's nominated? He's nominated. Oh, yeah, I don't know about this. Uh, first, if you want to talk about the nomination for peace, peace is not only about withdrawing your troops. It's a step, it's a good step, and it's a necessary step. But peace is about your policy, it's about your behavior, for, uh, means to, to stop occupying land, to uh, stop toppling governments just because they are not with you, to stop creating chaos in different areas of the world. Peace is to follow the international law and to support the United Nations char Charter, etc. This is peace. This is where you deserve Nobel Peace, peace Prize. Uh, Obama had this uh, prize. Uh, he, were, he had just been elected. He, he hadn't done anything. The only achievement he had that time, maybe he moved from his house to the White House and he had Nobel Price. Yeah. So they, could, they, they would give it to Trump for something maybe similar. <laughs> I don't know what is it, Before but the definitely not the peace. <laughs> uh, 
so he, um, Trump acknowledged recently that he uh, intended to eliminate you personally and that uh, the Pentagon chief Mattis persuaded him not to do so. Uh, did you know about that at that time? And were some measures undertaken to prevent it? Uh, assassination is uh, American modus operandi. That's what they do all the time for decades everywhere in different areas in this world. So it's not something new. So you have to keep it in your mind that this kind of plan is always existed for different reasons. Uh, and we have to expect this kind of plans in our situation in Syria with this conflict with the Americans. They occupy our land and uh, they are supporting the terrorists. So it's expected, even if you don't have any information, it should be self-evident. Uh, how to prevent, it's not about the incident per se, it's not about this plan regarding this person or this president, it's about the behavior. Nothing would deter the United States from committing such kind of vicious actions or acts unless there's international balance, where the United States cannot get away with its crime. Otherwise, it's going to continue this kind of acts in different areas. Nothing would, would stop it. And were there any other attempts from you during your presidency? I didn't hear of any, any, any attempt. But as I said, it's self-evident to that you have many attempts, or maybe let's say plans, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you don't, if I have to be more precise, mm -hmm. plans, were they uh, active or on hold? Nobody knows. Uh, now turning back to situation in Syria, and uh, will you run for presidency in uh, the year 2021? It's still early to talk uh, about it, but we still have, because we still have a few months. Uh, I can take this decision uh, at the beginning of next year. Interesting. And uh, have you congratulated Mr. Alexander Lukashenko uh, with his inauguration in Belarus? Mm -hmm. And uh, do you probably see similarities between uh, political technologies that uh, were used by the UK and the US uh, uh, to support Belarusian opposition mm -hmm. and those methods that were used against uh, Syria mm -hmm. and against the Syrian state in information uh, mm -hmm. war? Uh, I did uh, send a congratulation letter to President Lukashenko, and that's uh, uh, normal. But uh, regarding uh, what's happening in, in, uh, in Belarus, uh, regardless of the similarities between the two countries, between Syria and Belarus, or the differences, uh, regardless of whether you have real conflict or artificial one in a country, the West as long as it hasn't changed its hegemonic policy around the world, is going to interfere anyway in the world. If you have real problem in your country, whether it's a small or big, it's going to interfere. And if it's domestic, they're going to make it international just to interfere and meddle in your affairs. If you don't have problem, they're going to do their best to create problems and then to make it international again and meddle in your affairs. This is their policy. So it's not about what's happening in Belarus. Like any other country, Syria, Belarus, your country, every country, they have their own problems. Do the West have the right to interfere or not? That's what we have to oppose. So in the, uh, going back to your question, yes, it's the same behavior, it's the same strategy, it's the same tactics, the only difference it's the branding of the products, different headlines. Mm -hmm. They use certain headlines for Russia, another for uh, Venezuela, another one for Syria, and, and uh, so on. So yes, it's, uh, it's not about Belarus, it's about the behavior of the West, and it's about, uh, it's about their strategy for uh, the future, because they think with the rising of uh, Russia, with the rising of uh, China, with the rising of other powers around the world, this is exist existential threat for them. So the only way to oppose or to face this threat is by creating chaos around the world. Uh, so uh, you have already mentioned uh, the coronavirus and it affected uh, all the humankind. And uh, where's someone from the government uh, infected, or maybe you personally? 
Uh, thank God, no. And I don't uh, think any of uh, any one of our government has been uh, infected. Yeah, but good news. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, would you personally like to take the uh, Russian vaccine? Of course, uh, in these circumstances, anyone would love to be vaccinated against this dangerous uh, virus. But uh, I think it's not available for the international market yet, but we, we're going to discuss it with the Russian authority when it's available internationally to have, uh, for the, to have uh, vaccines for the Syrian market. It's very important. Yes, and Russians have already uh, suggested that it can be available for uh, our international partners. So They said in November it could mm -hmm. be available. Yeah. So you will be asking for, for the Russian vaccine? Definitely. It's necessity at these times. And in what amount? Uh, that depends on uh, how much available. And we have to, uh, to discuss the amount that we need with the health authority in Syria. So we are going to have negotiations of course, uh, definitely. in details with the of Russian course, authorities. Of course. Everybody in Syria is asking about the Russian vaccines, when it's going to be available, many Syrians.